Good morning. Good morning. He, is risen. he is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. What a wonderful morning. We had a great start as some of us went over to Florin for the uh, sunrise service and breakfast together and uh, just looking forward to more good things as we gather now. Thank you for those who have joined us and for those who are joining at home. I pray that you are you are blessed. Just a few uh, items to cover before we get into our worship time. So uh, I found out this week that Ken Brook is having a hymn sing next Sunday afternoon. They're having a lunch at 1230 and then singing at 130. You do not have to go for the lunch to go to the song time, but they're offering both. Uh, if you are coming for the lunch, they would like to know that. So there, you can call or email Ken Brook. If you need more details, see me later. Uh, voting day is coming up, and so again, the sign-up is out at the Welcome Center. If you would volunteer for an hour to, to be a greeter and open the doors and things as people come and go, we would appreciate that. And the National Day of Prayer is coming up on May the 2nd. Uh, there's, a, there's a breakfast and a, a service and time to pray for our community and nation and so on. And we hope that many of you will attend. The tickets are $10, and you can see Naomi uh, to get those tickets. Our annual ladies' banquet is coming up on May 11th, and there is now a sign-up out for that. Uh, we are having a special speaker, Cora Hurst, who does chalk drawing, will be here. And uh, tickets are not really tickets, but suggested donation is $10 for adults and $5 for children. So... Uh, if you have any questions, you can see Susan or one of the members of the uh, Women's uh, Ministry Committee. Our annual weekend at Roxbury is coming up on May 24th to 27th, and uh, I shared a good bit last week, so I won't say a lot, but we hope that you'll come out and camp with us for the weekend. If you can't come for the whole weekend, come for Sunday service and lunch together. There's a sign-up out there for lodging and also for items to bring for the meal. Um, also out on the Welcome Center is a card for Merle uh, Bundy's birthday. She was just here last week, so we encourage you to sign and give a greeting for her birthday, and then we will forward that on to her. Are there any other announcements this morning? Good. I didn't forget any this time. So um, last week, if you remember, we, we used one word over and over again. Who, who knows what, who remembers what that word was? Hosanna. And what did it mean? Save us. Yeah. I was reflecting this morning that the people, as they sang that, ch chanted that to Jesus as they came into the city, were just looking for him to save them in a physical sense from the Roman world that they lived under. And that's not what they got, but they got something better. And this morning we say a different word, hallelujah. Who knows what that word means? Praise the Lord or praise Yahweh, the I am, the God of the universe, because of what he has done. So would you join me in saying that? Hallelujah. hallelujah. One more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is a day of praise, and we'll say more about that in a little while. Let's join together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this morning and what it represents. That you have saved us. That you provided in your grace and mercy your Son to cover our sins so that we could be in relationship with you. And we say hallelujah. Praise the Lord for freeing us from the bondage of death and giving us new life giving us hope, giving us an eternal home to be with you. Lord, we look forward to that so much. And I pray that today would bring you the praise you deserve, that all of our songs, all of our prayers, all of our communication would lift you up to the place you deserve. And we pray that if there are any that don't know you, that they would hear your message and that your spirit would show them your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we want to invite you to stand and greet one another as we begin this morning. Yes, 
step down. Connor, I would recommend you staying up there. Just saying. Me step down. You can step down. Good morning, happy Easter. Thank you for joining us today. Please worship with us.
Dear God, I pray that you can bless the money and whoever it goes to. I pray that you can help us to give generously. And I pray that you can help the church to use it wisely. Amen. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. You may now stand.
Thank you, young people, for leading us and everyone for the heartfelt singing. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for this past Holy Week and for today when we celebrate Easter. Thank you for giving your son, Jesus, who came and died for each and every person. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Father, we believe your living word. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We ask that many more would come to hear and believe in Jesus and surrender their lives to walk in your ways. We pray for healing of broken bones, painful backs, necks, shoulders, discs, and hips. Please bring healing for diseases, for viruses and infections, and cancers of every type. Please touch, Lord, and comfort grieving hearts and emotional brokenness and fractured relationships. Pour your healing balm on us. We pray for those in prison, in prison because of wrongs they committed or others committed or because of persecution for their faith in you. Be among them. Jesus, reveal your truth and minister hope to them. Thank you, Lord, for your peace, even in the midst of turmoil. Please help those who lead the nations May they humble themselves and seek your wisdom. We ask that you would direct the world's affairs in such a way to accomplish your purposes. May soldiers and civilians alike call on you and know the peace that is beyond understanding and that you promised to your own. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the city you love. And best of all, thank you, Lord, for the power of your resurrection today. Thank you that Jesus overcame death, hell, and the grave. Now please continue, Lord, to receive our praises to you. Be glorified among us. Anoint Pastor Dwight and all those who proclaim your word today. Transform us more and more into your image that others might see Jesus in us each day. In Jesus' name, amen. For those that are guests with us, we have a special time for our young people, and if any of them would like to come forward and join us for that. You're welcome to do that. And as they're coming, I want to share two things. First, your singing was especially good today, and I think it was appropriate praise for the Lord today. Thank you for that. And second of all, those who attend here know that we've been going through the character of God in, in our sermon series, and next week we're going to be looking at God's character of forgiveness, and we have a special guest coming. Um, most of you are familiar with the Nickel Mines tragedy. Um, Marie Monville experienced God's forgiveness and others' forgiveness in a special way after that. 
and she'll be here to share with us next week. And so I wanted to let you know that. You all look so good this morning. Such smiling faces. Are you having fun? Good. So, who can remind everyone what we're learning about? Yeah. The image of God and how he's renewing it in us. Yes. So, what things have we learned so far about God's character? Yeah. He has a purpose for us. Yeah. So, we use the toothbrush to talk about a purpose and cleanliness, and that represents holy. Yeah. God's love never runs out like the everlasting golf stoppers. Yeah. He's always there. He's present with us. Yeah. He provides for us. Yep. He is faithful. Yeah, you guys are doing really well this morning. He always keeps his promises. Yeah, and we talked about his compassion, and we talked about his love a couple of weeks ago. And so today we're going to talk about two characteristics of God because they're so closely connected, you can't really separate them. And they have an awful lot to do with Easter that we're celebrating today. Anybody think they might know what they are? What two things? Mercy and grace. That's absolutely right. And so who can tell me what mercy and grace are? Okay, so mercy, he said, is having mercy, and he gave an illustration of if someone owes you a debt and they don't pay you full, full amount and you let that go, that's mercy. What's grace? Well, you know what? I have something to help us understand because those two can be very confusing. And uh, so, Connor, would you help me this morning? You're the only young man up here. So we're going to play a game, all right? And if you win a game, you, you get a prize, right? So if you win, I have a present for you. Does that sound good? If you don't win, guess what you get? You get this cup of water poured on your head. <laughs> but you're pretty good at games, right? So you think you can win, right? Maybe. Maybe? Do you want to try? Sure. sure. Okay. All right. So here's the game. I have a number between 1 and 10, and if you guess the right number, then you get the present. But if you get the wrong number, then you get the water over your head. You ready? Yeah? yeah? Okay. So what number do you think I'm thinking of? Three. You were so close. It was two. You almost had it. And like we said... The rules of the game are, if you didn't win, you get the consequences. You get the water over your head. Now, before I do that to this poor young man, <laughs> did you have a chance to win that game? Not really. Not really. Why? <laughs> Smart. Why not? Because it's pretty hard to ten numbers when you're thinking of one number. That's right. Here, you have three people and you get the closest. Okay. So if it would have been just guess the closest to the number or it, he said there was um, only one number out of ten so his chances weren't very good. You know something else? You really couldn't have won because if you would have guessed two, I would have said a number, num another number and you would have still lost. You didn't really have a chance. And the reason I say that is that's what we're like. We're talking today about Easter and God's mercy and grace. And it says that we were dead in our sins no matter what we did. We couldn't win. So back to the consequences. Are you all ready? No. No. <laughs> Why not? Because I don't want my clothes wet. You don't want your clothes wet. I should have brought a towel. <laughs> well, you, you know what? I'm going to give you this morning what God gives us. And that's mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. And he agreed to the rules. I asked him if he was ready. He said, sure. And he deserves this cup of water because he agreed. But we're going to take this water and we're going to pour it here so that I can't even get it back. 
If I would change my mind and say, you know what, I want to get Connor after all, there's no way for me to get that water back. That's God's mercy. He's given us forgiveness because of Jesus' death on the cross, and it can't be taken away. Now, do you wonder what you would have got if you won the game? You don't know. Does anybody else wonder what he would have got if he won the game? Yeah. Well, you know what? That's God's grace. Grace, mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. And even though you didn't get win the game, I'm going to give you the present. You can go ahead and open that. Let everybody see what it is. But that's what's so special about Easter. God doesn't give us the punishment we deserve for our sins because Jesus died on the cross. And he goes beyond that. He gives us so many special things. What kind of things does God give us through Jesus' death on the cross? I know you're all watching the present. I need you to answer the question. What, what did you get? A, a chocolate cross. So you can go ahead and have a seat. But that helps to represent God's grace. So what are, what are some things God gives us through Jesus' death on the cross that represent grace? His love. His love. What else? What do we get when we become a Christian? Logan? Logan? Eternal life with him. Help him out. Forgiveness of sins. A sound mind. We have peace. We could go on and on about the things God gives us as a result of Jesus' death on the cross. And those are all pictures of his grace. So one last question. We're learning not only about God's character and how special it is, but we're learning how God wants to renew that in us. How can we show mercy and grace to others? Yeah. Giving them what they don't deserve, like what? Forgiveness. forgiveness. We can forgive others, yes. What else? Not giving them what they do deserve. What might that look like between you and Logan? <laughs> Y'all, you want to stop there, okay. <laughs> yeah. There are lots of ways that we can show mercy and grace to others. And because God has shown that to us, we want to do that for others. Any questions? All right. You can head back to your seats, guys. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus, saying, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? We are punished justly for we're getting what we deserve, but this man, he's done nothing wrong. Then he turned and said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Those are some of my favorite verses in all of the New Testament, and I think they should be some of your favorite verses too. Here's why. Because I think that's the most simple and clear picture we have of the free grace of God. The good thief had nothing to give to God. No church attendance, no church membership, no baptism, no communion, no tithing, no mission trips, no prayer meetings, no Bible studies. No time to go and make right all the wrongs he had committed. No time to figure out how to nuance some of the doctrines of the Christian faith like justification by faith and the inerrancy of scriptures. No time to grow in holiness and sanctification. No time to impress anyone with anything. He had nothing to give to God. He is just a naked, dying, sinful man who can't even fold his hands to pray. But against all odds, that man walks into heaven in the same hour as Jesus. He walks into the kingdom of God with the King of Kings. I heard a pastor recently explain this story and 
what it could have been like. Now, I don't think it actually happened this way, but he says, just imagine what it would have been like for that thief to enter in to heaven. Suppose there are angels there greeting him, saying, now, now, who are you and how did you get here? And he says, I don't know exactly how I got here. They say, well, are you a Christian? Well, what's a Christian? Do you believe in salvation by grace alone through faith alone? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, do you at least believe in the full deity and humanity of Christ? Well, I, I'm not even sure what that means. Frustrated, the angels finally say, well, then on what basis are you here? And so the best that he could come up with is this. He says, the man on the middle cross said I could come. And that's the only answer anybody ever needs. The man on the middle cross said I could come. Jesus didn't die alone. He died next to a brother. He died next to a Christian. And the last day of that man's life turned out to be the best day of his life. The man on the middle cross said I could come. Makes this a day of praise. Easter is a celebration of God's incredible mercy and grace, which he poured out on us through Jesus' death and resurrection. 1 Peter 1, 3-4 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. That's what we're celebrating today. This incredible act of mercy that forgives what we've done and instead gives us a life that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And as we celebrate, we want to we reflect on this mercy and grace. Those are the characteristics we're looking at today. And I would like to begin our reflection in Psalm 103, if you would like to turn with me there. We're going to read the first six verses together, and I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation this morning. Verse 1, let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. In most Bibles, there's a heading at the beginning of this psalm that says it's a song of David. It's his words. And the song starts out with the understanding that we should praise God with everything we have, with our whole being in response to what God has done for us. We should pour out our whole hearts in praise. And as I said, I believe I heard that this morning in our singing. That energy, that excitement was there. And as we think about David, most of us know his story. David had a lot, a lot of good things that God had done for him that he could give praise for, didn't he? We read in the, in the scriptures that God helped him as he was a shepherd and he was able to defend the flock from bears and lions and things. That was through God's um, help and protection. He defeated Goliath with only a sling and a stone. He was protected from Saul when Saul wanted to take his life. God made him the king 
of Israel. And he made him a great warrior and he was victorious over and over again. And he was blessed with many children. But none of those things are in what we just read that God is, or excuse me, David is praising God for with his whole being. What does it say? If it wasn't all those good things, what is it that David is praising God for? He says, I praise God. Because he forgives all my sins, he heals all my diseases, and he redeems my life. If you were listening, we just defined mercy with the kids. It's not getting what we deserve. And what we deserve is punishment, suffering, and death because of our sins. David knew about sin and suffering, didn't he? We know the story of adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. We know that it resulted in the loss of their first son. We know the story of David's son Absalom, who killed his brother, one of David's other sons, and then was absent for a while. David eventually allowed him to come back, and then Absalom won the favor of the people and tried to push David out as king. He even sent an army to fight against David, his own son. David says, I give praise because God has freed me from the deserved consequences of these sins. In verses 4 to 6, David goes on to not just talk about mercy and not getting what he did deserve. He talks about grace, receiving what he doesn't deserve. And he says... That God crowns me with love. He fills my life with good things. He renews my youth. It's not a fountain of youth. It's the hope and wonder of youth that God gives back to David. Gives him righteousness. David wasn't righteous. He's proven that. Yet God gives him a covering of righteousness because of his grace. And David is filled with praise because of God's mercy and grace demonstrated in his life and as I said already we need to be people of full-hearted praise as well let's look a little farther in this psalm starting at verse 7 it says he revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel the Lord is compassionate and merciful slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. I believe as David wrote this psalm, and he began at the the beginning part of the psalm talking about God's goodness to him he wanted us to know that God's grace and mercy wasn't for him only see we could mistakenly think well David was God's chosen right David is described as the man after God's own heart so of course God showed him grace and mercy God wanted to use him in a special way so he got things we don't normally get I think David wanted us to know no it's not just for me Because he goes back to the story of Moses and the Israelites. And he talks about how God demonstrated grace and mercy to Moses and the Israelites as they traveled from Egypt to the promised land. In here, David quotes what we have seen previously in Exodus 34, verses 6 to 7. This was God speaking to the Israelites back then. And he said, he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. We've already looked at how this was God's message to the people. This is who God said he was. I'm compassionate. I'm gracious. I'm slow to anger. I'm abounding... All of those things. That was God speaking. And so David repeats those words here in this psalm, letting us know that God was showing mercy and grace to the Israelites. 
God wasn't just all talk. He lived out what he said. He didn't treat the rebellious Israelites the way they deserved. And he didn't remain angry with them. Over and over again, they turned away from God. We, we walked through the life of Moses last year. And we saw that. We saw how they were so quick to forget all that God had done and turn time after time. They even questioned God's goodness of whether he was really providing for them, of whether he was really going to lead them into the promised land. And yet he forgave them. And he graciously led them on. And he did bring them to a promised land that they didn't deserve. In the NIV translation, verse 10 of this psalm says, God did not treat them as their sins deserved. He doesn't do that to us either. David doesn't mention them in this psalm, but we have already talked in earlier lessons about how God showed restraint when Adam and Eve sinned. And then he graciously provided skins for their covering, covering of their sins and covering of their bodies. And God did it again in Genesis 6 when this world was so evil that it required his judgment, and yet he gave grace to Noah and his family. He did it again in the life of Abraham and his followers, and it goes on and on. And so we give praise today because God has always been merciful and gracious. But like David felt it personally, we can too. There's a message that's very personal for us. Even after all that God had done to reveal his mercy and grace in the Old Testament, in the lives of all these people, people continued to miss it. People continued to turn away from it. They continued to do their own thing. They certainly didn't offer grace and mercy, did they? They were living by the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth standard. That was all they heard from God. They couldn't catch his mercy and grace, and so they weren't really displaying that. So what did God do? Another flood? Sacrifice some more animals? No. God sent his son, Jesus, to live among us, to show us what he was really like, to show us how we were missing it. John chapter 1, verses 14 and then 16 to 17 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of Of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. Over and over again, God has shown grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. God had every reason to send judgment on the world. The people he had personally chosen to represent him had twisted his words and failed to demonstrate his character the way they were supposed to. His response was to give them his son, knowing what would happen to him. John 3.17 says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus was sent knowing he would be rejected and ridiculed in order to bring us God's mercy and grace. And I think perhaps Paul explains it best in his letter to the Ephesians. If you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, Paul lays out for us what Jesus did in his life, in his death, in his resurrection and how closely it is connected to God's mercy and grace. We're going to read the first nine verses of Ephesians chapter 2. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world, He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, 
We were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so, no, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Excuse me. It's going to wait a little bit, I think. Paul talks, starts out this chapter saying what we already heard. That like David, we are dead in our sins. We're facing God's anger and judgment. Every one of us. If we don't receive what God has given, we're facing his judgment. And in a few weeks, we'll be looking at God's justice to explain that a little bit more. But I like the way the wise woman who approached David about mercy and grace when his son Absalom was gone for several years and they thought it was time for him to come back, and she approached David to encourage him to bring Absalom home. She said to David in 2 Samuel 14, 14, Our lives are like water poured out on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Just like the water I poured into that flower pot, I can't fill that cup again with that water, can I? I have no way to get it back. That's what our lives are like. Without Jesus, we are dead. There's no way to get it back. Good news is, the verse doesn't end there. The second half of the words from the wise woman is, but God. We're lost, but God does not just sweep life away. Instead, he devises ways to bring us back when we have been separated from him. Praise the Lord. If you can't say amen to that, we're not alive. God devises ways to bring us back when we have been separated from him. That's the best news ever. How easily do we give up on people? How quick are we to think there's no hope? It's not worth the effort. They're never going to change. Not God. Even the water has soaked into the ground. And it seems impossible. God says, I've got that. I made a way. I made a way to... Make that alive again, to make it useful again. And Paul repeats these words in verse 4 of what we just read in Ephesians 2. He said, but God, we were dead, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when we raised Christ from the dead. We started out this section talking about how Jesus came full of grace and truth 
The truth is that God is rich in mercy and that he devised a way for us to be brought back to him. His love motivated him to show us mercy and not bring judgment we deserve, but instead graciously bring us new life. Not just any life. Life to the fullest. And he says in the middle of the passage that we read, it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. It's nothing that we do. It's all because but God. We just read in verse 5 that God gave us life. That's the mercy part. We're no longer facing the eternal death we deserve. God has provided a way to escape for that, from that. If he had done just that, we would be amazed. It would be wonderful. It would be not getting what we deserve, death. But God went farther than that and he showed us grace. He raised us up with him to the heavenly realms, it says. It reminds me of the passage we looked at in 2 Peter that says we can participate in the divine nature of God because of what Jesus has done. He's lifted us up to a position we don't deserve, but he gives us anyways. And he gives us internal life and he gives us strength and he gives us hope and he gives us peace. He gives us all the things that we live. That same passage in 2 Peter says... We have been given everything we need for a godly life. That's God's grace. And Paul says that we will be examples throughout eternity of this amazing grace and kindness that God has shown towards us. We call what Jesus did on the cross and and through his resurrection, salvation. Because it saves us from the fate we deserve, the the death that we talked about. And this mercy and grace are available to anyone. Sadly, not everyone receives it. And you say, wait a minute, that doesn't seem fair. If it's available to everyone, then why doesn't everyone get it? It's because we made a choice in the first place to turn away from God. He didn't turn from us. We turned from Him. And all He asks in return is for us to acknowledge that and acknowledge that He's provided a way of restoration. And when we do that, then we receive His grace and His salvation. What we read here in Ephesians 2 says that God saved you by His grace when you believed. When you accepted the message. We saw that two weeks ago when we looked at the character of God's love for us. And just like we said, God wants us to believe that he is by nature loving and not doubt that. Not question whether he loves, oh, he loves them, but not really me. We said, no, we need to live live with the knowledge that God loves me, likes me, because he made me. We need to feel the same way about God's mercy and grace. We need to believe it. We need to believe that Jesus really hung upon a cross, carried the weight of our sin, physically died, was placed in a tomb, and was gloriously raised to life again because of God's mercy and grace. We need to believe that. And when we do, then we receive it. One of the risks for those who have been believers for a while is to forget why they needed saved in the first place, isn't it? And that's a very dangerous place to be. That's why Paul includes the words here, you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Today is a day of praise. But it's also a day to remember what the praise is for, that he forgives all my sins, he heals all my diseases, and he redeems my life. 
he makes the water poured into the ground usable again. Worthwhile. We read here that God forgives our sins and that he removes them as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't want us to continue to live in a life of guilt and shame. He wants us to remember why it's possible not to. He wants us to remember not that we saved because we found a solution, not because we worked hard for it, not because we're better than our neighbor or the person that's out there doing something else this morning. We are saved only because of God's mercy and grace. It had nothing to do with us. Paul says this in first Timothy chapter excuse me, second Timothy chapter one, verses nine and ten. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from the beginning of time, to show us. His grace through Jesus Christ. And now he has made all of this plain to us by appearing, by the the appearing of Christ Jesus our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. His plan from before the beginning of time was to show us his grace. Through Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's who God is. God is a God of mercy and grace. And it's an extension of his great love for us. And we're reading here from Paul in Ephesians 2. And those who were here a few weeks ago when we talked about God's selflessness, we saw that as Paul wrote about Jesus' selflessness in giving himself on the cross. And he called the people to have that same attitude in their own lives, to become selfless. And Paul didn't just talk the talk, he he walked the talk. And we saw how in, in the next few verses, he explained that he was sending Timothy to the people so that they could be comforted. Even though Timothy was the most important person in his life that was caring for Paul while he was in prison, Paul was living out selflessness. Paul does the same thing here as he's talking about God's mercy and grace. We're in Ephesians 2. We're going to skip to the beginning of chapter 3. And we're going to read the first 11 verses. When I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed this mysterious plan to me. As you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his Spirit he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body, and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul says that he was given a special responsibility to bring God's mercy and grace to others. 
Paul calls it a privilege to be, be called to do that, to share the good news. And God's desire that Jews and Gentiles, essentially the whole world, will share equally in the riches His grace is providing. He wants all to enjoy the blessing of His promises. In verse 10, Paul says that God's purpose was to use the church, that's us, to display the rich variety of His wisdom. That's another way of saying we are to demonstrate His mercy and grace to a lost and broken world. That was His eternal plan that He initiated with Jesus' death and resurrection. And now we're responsible to show this to the world. In Matthew chapter 9, we have the words of Jesus. The words of Jesus to the people who were living by an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Who the scripture said wouldn't even lift a finger to help those who were trying to find God. And he says, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call those who think they are righteous. Excuse me, not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. God wants the message of mercy and grace to get out, and he wants to use us to do it. I want to close with this story I found. A man named Robert Robinson was born in England in 1735. That's a while ago. He was a rather difficult, headstrong boy. And when his father died at the age of eight, things only got worse. When he turned 14 in 1749, his mother sent him to London for an apprenticeship. To no one's surprise, he was just as much a troublemaker in London. And to make matters worse, he gained some friends and followers as a leader. When he was 17, he took this gang of young people to a revival service led by George Whitfield. And we imagine that he probably said something like, let's go down and make fun of all the poor, deluded people listening to this message. But something happened that night that Robert wasn't expecting. After hearing the message, it moved him deeply and it made him rethink his life and how he was living it. And it took another three years, but after hearing that sermon, a 20-year-old Robert Robinson made his peace with God. And it says that he found full and free forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he joined the Methodist, and he felt the call to preach. And so he was self-taught, and he was appointed by John Wesley to the Methodist chapel in Norfolk, England. It was there to accompany his sermon for Pentecost in 1758, the three-year anniversary of his conversion, he wrote these words of the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Some of you know this song. The first verse says, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it. Mount of thy redeeming love. This first stanza is all praise and adoration for what God had done in his life. But the last two stanzas of this song were, seemed prophetic. For sadly, Robinson drifted away from his faith. And one day he was traveling by stagecoach beside a young woman and the woman began to sing that very song. And when she got to the verse that says, Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. He burst into tears. And Robinson said, Madam, I'm the poor unhappy man who wrote that hymn many years ago. And I would give a thousand worlds if I could enjoy the feelings I had then. He seemed greatly surprised, but she reassured him that the streams of mercy mentioned in the song still flowed, and they were still available to him. He was once again deeply touched, and he turned his wandering heart to the Lord. He was restored to full fellowship. 
Another part of the song says, O to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. God wants nothing more this morning than for your heart to be bound to him because of his amazing mercy and grace. I don't know where each of you are in your relationship with God. I don't know if one of you has never experienced that. But I believe I would be failing in my service to the Lord if I did not give you an opportunity to respond to that call for mercy and grace. So our young people are going to come and get ready to sing our final song. And if you have heard God's call today, if you've been touched by this message of mercy and grace and you want to experience it, then I encourage you as, as they sing to come forward. And I always share this. Many pastors will say, close your eyes and bow your head and just pray with me. But I don't think that does justice to our Savior who died publicly for our salvation to say privately, I want to follow you. I think we're making a decision that should be lived in front of the world. And so if you're ready to receive that grace, we encourage you, come as we sing. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace. So undeserved. But we rejoice in who you are in your nature and that you give us ways to be restored. May your word touch those who need to hear it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand to finish our sing, to finish our last song. Is there a burdened soul here that needs to find that release, that grace, that mercy? Anyone who would come and receive this morning? Father, we again thank you that all of this is available to us. It's nothing that we've done. It's nothing that we deserve. For those who already know you, remind us of why we needed it, why we need your grace. Keep us from being self-reliant, self-confident, and let us share the, mercy, the message of mercy and grace with others. For any who may be here, I pray that you're, who don't have this grace yet, I pray that they would believe. I would pray, pray that they 
believe you are a God of mercy and grace and that you want to extend it to them and that they would find rest for their soul. Now I leave you with these words. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.